Our next guest emerges from a space where storytelling transcends mere tales to become powerful dialogues of our past and present. I discovered her name during an interview with Peter Bromberg at Every Library, who shared that his favorite band book is Out of Darkness, a poignant story about a forbidden romance between Naomi, a Mexican girl, and Wash, an African-American boy, amidst the racially segregated backdrop of 1937 Texas. Their love story explores deep themes of race, love, and societal upheaval in a narrative that is as heart-wrenching as it is socially insightful. The book has won many awards, including the prestigious Prince Honor for Excellence in Young Adult Literature. It is also notable for being among the top 10 banned books in America. Our guest unveils aspects of history, society, and human relationships that provoke thought and facilitate deeper understanding and dialogue among readers. Please welcome a storyteller, a weaver of emotions, Ashley Hope Perez. Thank you so much. That was a beautiful introduction. I'm really moved. When you were a teenager, did you always want to be a writer? I've been a writer as long as I can remember. And I did want to be a writer. But when I was a teenager, I think it felt like a... Um, a distant goal. So I think I felt like I was a writer, but I wanted to be an author. And there's a difference. A writer is someone who writes and an author is someone who writes and shares their work with others. And so I think that I became an author uh, when I started entering contests or like submitting my work to literary magazines. And I really enjoyed that. But when it really came together for me was when I was teaching high school in Houston and I shared my writing. I started writing for my kids, my students. And um, the first book I wrote, What Can't Wait, I wrote for them. And I think that is when, when I shared my work with an audience I really, really cared about and knew. That's when I felt like I became an author and I was 20 when I started teaching high school. So I was barely older than a teenager when I um, became an author. So in college, did you write? I did write in college. I think I, I always tell people, you know, you, you, I wrote, yeah, I wrote, I started writing in, I'd say I was writing poems, bad poetry in middle school. And then in high school, I was writing like, short fiction and essays. And in college, a couple of times there was, there was one, I won, I won contests when I would write in college. And one month I submitted to a bunch of different things and I made enough off of the contest to pay my rent for one month. And I really felt like a big deal when I did that. <laughs> in Out of Darkness, you vividly bring up to life a narrative set against the backdrop of the new London school, explosion of 1937 in Texas a horrific event resulting from a natural gas leak that claimed over 295 lives and led to a regulatory changes regarding odorization of natural gas to prevent such tragedies in the future. Given the weight and historical significance of this event, could you share what specific events or experiences inspired you to weave this dark chapter of history into your narrative? Thank you. Yeah, I grew up about 20 minutes from New London, uh, and I had a vague idea that something had really sad had happened there. And I, I heard about it a little bit from my grandfather, my grandmother, excuse me, my dad's mom. And then my dad would usually be the one I was driving with. He had a little clinic. He was a veterinarian. He is a veterinarian. And we would drive by where the school was, and there's like a monument but beyond that, when I was growing up, I actually didn't know any, I didn't know that hundreds of kids had died. I didn't know the, in any of the kind of particulars or how it had impacted the community. And it seems really odd to me as I got older and started to hear a little bit about it. I was confused about how was it that I grew up and, you know, I was born in 1984. I grew up in this area and I never heard about it. And the reason was that until the 2000s, survivors really were silent. And that came from adults in the community back in the 1930s saying, you need to put this behind you and move on with your life. Um, and so people lived alone with having lost siblings, having lost girlfriends, having lost teachers, having lost you know best friends. 
all they lived with that all alone and so many people had a, a great deal of like guilt and shame about you know having there are a lot of details in the book that i incorporate like two kids changing seats and one kid who the kid one kid dies and the other one survives and the sense of if we hadn't changed seats it would have been me and that person would still be alive that kind of thing or kids you know to change shoes and so we're originally misidentified and then later they you know they had to reconnect the the remains of a child with the right family um I think that that one of the things, the reasons that I was really drawn to the story, besides all of the dramatic possibilities and the important history, was just that I wanted to uh, tap into what I think is a core truth, that painful experiences happen to people and we can support them in healing, or if we force them into silence, we can leave them alone with their pain. And that's what happened to a lot of people who survived that explosion. And as people started talking about it and sharing their stories, they experienced late in their lives. We're talking about people in their, you know, in their seventies, they experienced healing and support. And I think that really resonates with how I approach young adult literature more broadly. My belief is that we need to be honest about painful realities and that young people, particularly teenagers, young adults who are on the cusp of the adult world and many of whom are actually dealing with very challenging situations, we need to respect those readers and address harsh realities and painful experiences in all aspects of human uh, reality honestly not sugarcoating it or varnishing it. And that's what I learned from my students. My students were really clear. We would be in the library and they would tell me what they wanted to read. And they wanted to read books that didn't feel fake, that didn't feel like some grown up was cleaning up the edges to make, to keep from, you know, upsetting someone. They wanted it to be truthful. And I think that that is, that's my guideline. That's my guiding, um, I don't know, um, principle when I'm writing is to respect the readers that I'm writing for. And sometimes that is very scary because with a book like Out of Darkness, the world my characters live in is ugly. I mean, it is it is racist. It's painful. It's also beautiful. And there's opportunity for family and connection. And I think readers who read a book like Out of Darkness, they want something better for the characters. They want a different world. And that can be inspiring of change and continuing to work towards more room for everyone in the world we have now. Can you share some insights into how you developed the characters of Naomi and Wash, ensuring they remained authentic and true to their historical period in which they lived? Uh, so part of how I ended up, I mean, I, I, I my approach to, to young adult fiction is to think about whose stories aren't being told and ca- can I responsibly have a role in bringing attention to a story that's not being told. And one of the things that happened as I was researching the New London school explosion is that when I would ask anybody about, well, what about the black community? They acted like I was actually insane. Um, I mean, you know, they were they in, in an East Texas nice way. Um, they'd be like, well, you, you know, that didn't really matter to them or whatever, because it was a white school. And this was during the time of Um, intense school segregation. And so black students weren't allowed to attend the school, which by the way, was the richest rural school in America because of oil and gas revenues. So kids, it's the middle of the depression, but these kids can take classes for college credit. Every kid can play an instrument. There are athletics. They have electric lights for the football stadium, like Friday night lights started in New London, Texas. Um, But Black kids didn't get to enjoy any of that uh, opportunity. They were stuck in an underserved um, school. And so I really I really was struck by that question of, well, what did it mean to be spared or for your kids to be spared, but for that to have been because they'd been excluded from that opportunity? And so Wash, um, the teenager who is from New London, uh, he is... gives readers a chance to see what does 
what does the what does racism at this time mean for education and what does it mean for his realities and he really wants to shake things up but that's an extremely dangerous thing in 1937 um and then naomi is a mexican-american teenager from san antonio she ends up in new london because she has um twin half siblings so her stepfather's kids with her mother who's dead um are super bright and the their their father has kind of had this like transformation where he thinks he's supposed to bring his family back together he has been out of the picture for them for um nearly a decade so they he convinces um naomi and the twins grandparents to uh send them to new london so that the kids can go to this great school and um naomi is is Mexican American, the kids are the the younger um, siblings are half white, and they are able to pass more easily as white in this community. But Naomi stands out, and she has to navigate the racial dynamics of uh, a rural East Texas community where there are firm lines: this black people here, white people here, and she doesn't fit. Um, and so she encounters an even more um, intense, in some ways isolation because she doesn't belong um she she encounters a lot of racism in the white community and she doesn't people in the black community are anxious because she's she's an outsider there too so wash is really first a friend and then becomes um her her love um and and a guide to help her figure out how the heck does she buy groceries her her stepfather's like here's money to get groceries she is kicked out of the white store, told to go to the colored entrance. And so what is she, how is she supposed to navigate all of that? And he helps her. Um, and so as far as authenticity, I do a lot of research, even for my contemporary fiction, I do a lot of research. Um, but with this, you know, there are oral histories from Black Americans who lived at the time. I did a lot of interviews, uh, but I also was using materials from other communities to examine what happens in a place like New London when there is a community trauma. And one of the things that we know about lynchings and racialized violence is that they are often triggered by other issues in the community. So economic downturns or um, something like this, where there's a tragedy that when people are looking for a scapegoat, they often look at those communities that aren't protected. Um, and in the case of New London, um, Wash is part of that community. So he's extra vulnerable um, to targeting as a scapegoat when this explosion happens. So that's the fact, you know, Wash and Naomi are made up, but the dynamics of the story are historical. Out of Darkness addresses some incredible, potent and dark themes, such as racial prejudice, and tragic loss. How did you navigate through writing these difficult scenes while maintaining sensitivity and authenticity? Yeah, that's it was really hard. I definitely think that when I when I was finishing this book, I was terrified because it is it ended up uh, asking more of me than any book I'd ever written. Um, I thought when I started writing this book that I knew what the tragedy was. And in my own family and my own experiences of childhood sexual abuse, but also, you know, in my family, the, my, my great aunt, um, was positioned in some of the ways that Naomi is in this book, you know, um, having in a, in a family with a lot of kids having, she had her own room that had a lock on it. Um, and her father, um, you know, abused her and it, there was a way that it was known but not known it was uh not there there wasn't a framework for addressing it and if you uh, i think about her mother and the situation she would have been in with little financial independence little power to um get help and i think that um i wanted to face some of those realities and that's something that as i as i started understanding who this character this of the stepfather was i knew that i just couldn't pretend that um he would leave let naomi alone for example um and i think that i was terrified that people would read the book and 
think that I just wanted everyone to wallow in pain. Uh, and I, I worked really, really hard to fill every space in the book with the hopes and dreams of my characters, their desire for connection and transformation and playfulness um, so that people would recognize the all of the possibility that these characters' lives uh, held and how much the racism and, you know, um, power dynamics of the time where where a white man like Henry didn't really have to answer to anyone, how much that interfered with those beautiful possibilities. Um, and I was really fortunate that back in 2015, when this book was published, people were ready for it. Um, we were just starting to have a national conversation about racialized violence. And I think people could really see how a book like Out of Darkness helped to frame how do we still have a situation in which one teenager can walk through a park and relax and enjoy the sunshine and another teenager can walk through that park and their the very fact of their body being black makes them uh, perceived as a threat and a target for violence. Um, and I think that Pe readers really did receive it that way and, uh, until 2021. So this book was on shelves from 2015 to 2021 without a single complaint. Um, and so I know that reader, and I hear from people who do read the book, that it's a hard book. And I, I know it's a hard book because I lived inside it. Um, but it's also a powerful book. And it's a book that um, breaks your heart in a way that makes you want to build a better world. And I think that that's one of the gifts that fiction can give readers to help them feel deeply and also feel the need for change in our world. Can you tell us a little bit about the research process that went into ensuring the historical and sociocultural accuracy of Out of Darkness? Uh, I'd love to say a little more about that. I, I think, you know, I mentioned research already, but I think that with a book like Out of Darkness, for me, there there are certain things like I was able, I know a ton about the explosion that's not in the book, right? Um, that So the, all those details and getting right, like what, you know, what, uh, what was the heating system in this school like? And what was the investigation? And how did parents react? And what would have happened or what did happen, in fact, if um, a, a, a Black man came to the site of the explosion to help? You know, it's important for readers to understand something like in in this time, even 30 years later, to sh for a white person in the South to shake hands with a Black person could bring social like ostracism. That's how deep the the racial divide uh, that placed all the power in the hands of the white community um, has been. And so if you think about that, what washed in the book is at the side of the school when it, when it explodes. And so his, I mean, Naomi is there, um, the twins are there and his immediate reaction is to help. And he is the reason that several children survive um, because he's able to get get them out before parts of the school collapse. Um, you would think that would make folks grateful. However, the the very thought in some of these people's minds of a black man touching a white child or touching the body of a white child was infuriating. And so there's a scene in the book that captures that. And that is very consistent with the historical record around, you know, um, white rage around interpersonal contact with, um, particularly with black men. There are other things like, I, I mean, a ton of research around what, what happened with the anger in the community about this event. Um, in real life, there was a mob of people who showed up at one of the, I can't remember if it was the super, I think it was the superintendent or maybe it was a school board member's house, like demanding answers and probably ready to hurt someone. And for that person, for the white school leader, the Texas Rangers were there to kind of dis dispel the crowd and push them away so that they didn't hurt this you know, this person who was connected to the school. Well, 
and my that that's where it stopped in in the historical reality. In my book, I ask, okay, what happens in those in those times if then the crowd or the mob has someone else to target? And so in this case, they go to Egypt town, which is the black community, and they are looking for um, Wash and his father because there there's this idea that they're there to blame for what happened. And that kind of stuff, though, it didn't happen in New London. It did happen in other places that there would be a crisis like this and part of how the white community handled the unbearable loss or the pain of something was to inflict pain on a community or on a person in a community who had no recourse because the, I mean, when we know this from, from lynchings, lynchings went unpunished and um, the, the, there would always be a kind of pretext created for why a person was killed um, and everyone in the community knew what had happened, um, but no one was held accountable. And in fact, um, if, if I feel like and some folks don't know this, that lynchings and at this time in the twenties and thirties were like picnics, like people would take, there were like photographers there. People would pose with the, the lynched body of a person. It was, you know, like grinning. So, I mean, this was a really, this it's, painful to recognize that that was there but that is historically consistent that kind of behavior and and that kind of um harm without accountability wow i can imagine how horrible that time in america was did you add those gruesome details to the story uh i didn't i did not incorporate the element of there being a photographer um but you can like i i think that there is i do incorporate into the book what happened like what is the experience the absolute terrorization of a community when you know for for wash's family for people to show up ready to kill ready to beat ready to kill ready to destroy their home and for the neighbors too to know that they're they you know there's a kind of everyone has to hunker down and and wait it out because if a neighbor comes out and tries to help they'll they end up victimized as well it's it's devastating so there is a scene that explores explores what those kinds of dynamics are like um and the pressure to participate your book out of darkness reminds me of the hate you give by andy thomas both novels explore themes of race identity, and social injustice. Both novels employ a young adult lens to explore poignant and painful racial realities in the United States, making them impactful for readers like me. And both novels are frequently banned. How did you first react when you learned that Out of Darkness was being challenged and banned in some schools and libraries? Thank you for that comparison. I think that uh, The Hate You Give is a great example of why I want, I wrote Out of Darkness for young adult readers. Besides the fact that I am always thinking about my former students, I feel like I want Out of Darkness to be in the same conversation with a book like The Hate You Give, because Out of Darkness, if The Hate You Give is is now, where are we now? What is still happening now? Out of Darkness is this, um, uh, provides uh, an understanding of what are the deep roots of the present reality, right? Like, where does that come from? What did it mean? How is it that policing now looks the way that it looks? And how is that connected to the fact that in 1937, the police were nowhere to be found in terms of protecting Wash and his family or Naomi? Um, and in fact we're often participants or collaborators with racialized violence so that's something that's a that's a connection that young people have a right to make um, and having those books in the same conversation helps with that uh, but you had asked about um how did i how did i react when the book was first being banned uh it's interesting the the trajectory because now in we're in October of 2023, and the book has been banned, we know of, in at least 41 school districts, which is a lot. Um, but the first 
uh, was in Central Texas, and I'm a Texan, uh, in Leander Independent School District. And basically a group of parents, and, and we now know that this has been a national agenda that was being pushed through um local communities, but is very centralized. It's very consistent o- across the different places where it's happening. And it's very consistent that the folks are targeting a certain kind of book. So in this community, uh, we we really saw a template set for what's happened over and over around the country. Uh, but what they did was essentially target books that had been added to an independent reading program where students had choices of what books to read. If they didn't like any of the books on the list, they could pick a different book and get it approved. So no one was being forced to read Out of Darkness. Um, It was just an option. Um, But the school district had tried really hard to diversify the texts that they were um, putting on the list so that young people had access to a more varied uh, set of perspectives. The parents targeted in this case, or the 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 group, the right wing group in this area, targeted exactly those books that have been added to diversify the list, uh, and I think that it, it it made it it was really striking that that was the case, and that's been the case over and over. That it's 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 of course, out of darkness is is mature. Uh, and it's for mature readers and a and a young person who doesn't want to face those realities, doesn't want to um, navigate those engagements with you know sexual harm, is going to put that book down. They don't want to read it, and that's completely fine. I'm, as an educator, very uh, clear that young people. Uh, they know if they're ready to read something or not. And this is not a book being assigned in anybody's class where they have to read it. So a kid in the library who reads the prologue of Out of Darkness, which already makes very clear that it's going to be a book with pain and suffering in it because it's a snapshot of the explosion and the aftermath of the explosion, that reader who does not, who's just like, dude, I just would like a romance novel, or I just want to read something about kids having fun. They're going to put that book down and put it away. So I was really, I was really struck by the fact that these people were so worked up and have continued to be so worked up about mature content and literature. uh, When Young people have a right to know about the world, but also young people are able to decide if they want to engage with that material or not. And I think that the thing that felt has felt shocking to me and still is shocking to me is that that ultimately what these groups want to do is to take away resources that matter to some kids. And there's a failure to understand or refusal, because I don't think that this is really in good faith. I don't really think it's about kids, but there's a failure to understand that a student who doesn't want to engage with a book like Out of Darkness uh, doesn't have to, but a kid who wants and needs that book should be able to. Uh, And I think that the way that we know that these actions are not sincere, that they're not about parents just being concerned Uh, It's really clear with books like Out of Darkness that have been on shelves since 2015. There are parents, um, there are not even parents, there are community members who have challenged Out of Darkness, who did not have kids in high school anymore. Their kids had graduated. This was the case in Keller ISD in Texas. A woman challenged Out of Darkness. And then as the the Dallas Morning News, you know, published a piece by her. I wrote a response. One of the things that came out is that her kids had graduated from high school. When they graduated, they'd been in high school for four years with Out of Darkness on the bookshelf. And never in the time that they were in school did she have a problem with the book. It was only when right-wing groups started telling people, these are the books you should complain about, that this parent felt it was inappropriate or that she should challenge it. And so to me, that really reveals what is this about? This is about a very small group of people trying to um, control what others have access to. And I find that 
incredibly upsetting. And when I think about what a book like Out of Darkness or The Hate You Give would have meant to my students back in 2004, I feel infuriated for students now to be losing access to those important books. By taking away the book, they're erasing history. Yes. And that's on purpose. It's not like they're like, oh, oh no, we accidentally erased some history. They want to see those those realities of what, you know, what has America been for some communities? They don't want young people engaging with that because what, what, why? It forces accountability. It says, hang on, there are harms that need to be redressed. And so something like, you know, reading a book like Out of Darkness gives a young person a framework for, oh, I wonder that it makes sense that affirmative action is important, right? Look at how much we have to recover from. These groups do not want that to be a thought in kids' heads. And I find that, I think it's so sad, but it really is, um, it's really wrong because it's taking away resources from those folks, kids, and from every kid in a school. And at this point, you know, I mean, it was shocking the first time. I'm still not over Every, every new band I hear, I think about that's hundreds, thousands of kids who have lost a resource, who can't find out about something, who can't see themselves, who don't see their communities. My students had no idea that in Texas, there were three ways of segregating young people for their great grandparents, that there were black schools, that there were white schools. And then in places like San Antonio and Houston, there were Mexican schools that had their own set of problems. My students didn't know that history and they had a right to know that history. And kids now have a right to, to know that history. So it, it really, you put it really well that, that this is an, an attempt to erase aspects of our history. What drives your commitment to writing young adult literature, particularly focused on historical and sociocultural narratives? Yeah, I, I am always thinking about my former students. So back in 2004, when I was a teacher in Houston, that books like Out of Darkness and The Hate You Give uh, weren't in school libraries. Um, it, there was a pretty narrow range of experience represented, and it was uh, predominantly white, predominantly middle class, predominantly straight, like those in young adult literature, that was the, the default. And I think that I saw what that meant for my students, their feeling of like, there's not really something here for me. Uh, and of course, we read across difference. And in fact, um, folks with non-dominant identities have learned the skill of reading literature and relating to experiences unlike their own out of necessity, because much of what has been taught in literature um, focuses on white people. But I think that everyone also deserves to have the gift of seeing an experience that resonates with them or that that gives them language to talk about an experience that they've had um, that they haven't seen uh, addressed as literature. And I know for me, as I, I, you know, I grew up in East Texas, I, when I went to college, when I told someone where I was from, I had a professor who said that can't be true. There's no way East Texas produced you in a mind like yours. And it, it hurt my feelings. Right. I mean, cause I'm like, I am from where I'm from, but it was also something that kind of created this sense of where like literature doesn't come from where I'm from. And I remember uh, encountering a book by William Goyen called House of Breath, which is set where I grew up. It's set in East Texas and it, in the Piney Woods. And it is, it is beautiful. And it, I remember what it felt like to see my world, like the accent you know, I don't have an accent because I squeezed it out of myself out of, you know, academic anxiety and and a desire to be from anywhere else. Uh, but that book, it was absolutely it was just East Texas. It had the sounds of East Texas that had the place and to encounter where I was from as literature was so powerful for me. And it 
it gave me a sense of orientation uh, to literature that li- like a sense of literature can hold it all. But it also gave me a sense of belonging. I belong in literature. And I think that that is something that I want for every kid. And I want every kid to have the capacity and the imagination and the curiosity to read across differences, to be curious about other people's experiences, to engage with different perspectives. But I also want kids to have that experience of, oh, this story that feels so much like my life or this story that's about what my great grandparents might've experienced, it belongs in literature. And I think that there's, there's actually, I think about it a lot, just like the optics for young people of when, a uh, I've got my mom, moms for libraries, when a mom for Liberty shows up in a school board meeting and is like, this book doesn't belong in my kid's library. This is disgusting filth. Look at the cover, right? Like they're telegraphing a message that's not just about the fact that this book has sexual content, um, which is a human experience, like any other human experience and belongs in literature, uh, but they're telegraphing a message about identities and they're saying something about whose stories belong and whose stories don't. And I think it's a really it's a really um, hostile message. It's a really damaging message and it's a really misguided message. Um, and I think one last thing that I, 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 I think I remembered what I wanted to say earlier about um, how this is a misguided effort is that, you know, even if, even for parents who are like, are uncomfortable with the fact that literature from the Bible, and I grew up reading the entire, I read the entire Bible. The Bible is full of sexual content. It's full of violence. It's full, uh, it has erotic poetry. It has a uh, description of male genitals. That stuff's all actually in the Bible. It's there. And, and folks can still recognize the literary value and cultural value of that book. All of the books that have been targeted claiming that they're, you know, like genderqueer, claiming that they are pornographic because they have, they engage with sexuality or sexual experience as a human experience fails to address the fact that that literature engages with those experiences and it always has. And they pick and choose which books they want to have a problem with. So no, I've yet to see a mom for liberty challenge the Bible, right? Other folks have done it to make that point I just made, um, but they're only concerned, it seems, with sexual content or violence when it's involving police brutality or when it's involving non-white characters or it's involving LGBTQ characters. No one's bringing up the stacks and stacks and stacks of books in any library that are about white straight people having sex. (laughs) You know, I mean, they're about other things, right? But they include that in the same way that our books include uh, other sexual experiences. And so I feel like that's a really clear illustration that the agenda is something else. Like you were saying earlier, it's much more about erasing histories and erasing communities and saying, I, I, as a person with a dominant identity get to say that you don't belong. Um, and I, I hate that for young people. Uh, they deserve so much better. And the worst of it is that most young people don't know what's happening in their library. You know, kids like my students, if it didn't, if the book wasn't in a school library, it might as well not exist. They didn't know what was, what was missing if right, if something was missing from the library. And I think that's part of what makes all of this so harmful is that there are some young people who will simply never become readers. Like they will read for class, but they won't read for themselves because they will have had taken away from them the books that would have been that bridge to their own encounter with literature. And I think that That's also, again, when we come back to what are these groups, they have no positive vision of education. They only want to subtract things. And someone who says, what I want to do with education is take things away from kids is not someone who's putting kids first. I think it's all about perspective and your points are very valid. Could you share some insights into your writing process 
especially how you balance creating and engaging narratives while also addressing complex and often tragic historical events. Yeah, I mean, you know, Out of Darkness is technically historical fiction, although if I were like present if I were talking to a teenager about a book, I would just never, ever, ever, ever call it historical fiction because it sounds like you like you hear the word history, you're like <sighs> um, but I really wanted to write the novel that addressed this this explosion, the realities around segregation, the the experiences of harm that many of my students had had. I had many um, young women in my classes who'd experienced sexual assault or abuse. Um, I wanted to address those realities in a way that would appeal to my, uh, my students, that would make them want to turn the page. So I really do think, like, I really do think about how to interweave um, the the weight of the history with the core things that make us want to read something curiosity like uh emotion right you're like oh you know, you're like oh no I, this is not i do not like where this is going and also i need to know what's going to happen to this person that i've come to care about um humor um and beauty and i think that one of the things that I'm always trying to do when I write and I did this with my students. It's what it's what we shared as writers is the knowledge that we can't control or prevent pain in our lives. I mean, my students had had more at their age, more painful experiences than I, you know, than I could even imagine. Um, some of them, not all of them. Um, and I think that one of the things that I had to focus on was that I couldn't take those experiences back from them. I couldn't protect them from them and I couldn't erase them from their lives, but I could give them tools for making meaning and beauty out of painful things. And so I think that is how I approach history is what is, what is the potential here for making something beautiful out of something painful and dark. And I think that um, young people are responsive to that combination. And so it's usually the older folks who have issues with dark material in literature. They are the ones who are uncomfortable with it, not, not the teenagers. And I think that the, one of the arguments I wish I could make, if I could ever, if I could get some of these folks in the room with, would be to say, Hey, does your kid have a cell phone? Does your kid, do you have Netflix? Because all of these issues and experiences are in music and film and media. They're already there. Because why are they there? And there's not, it's not wrong that they're in on Netflix or that whatever, but issues of like of conflict and painful history and violence and sexuality, they're there because we as humans are really interested in understanding those realities everybody is, you know, it needs, people are going to interact with that in the ways that they choose, but it's already all around there. So why is it that the one place that you're worried about it is here in a book? And I, I think that what I would say to them, I was like, you know, even if your strong preference would be for your kid to simply not engage with those histories or simply not imagine that, people are sexually assaulted. Uh, the fact is they're going to encounter that content. And in books, if they're curious about those realities and they're reading in books, they can't help but improve their vocabulary. They can't help but become better readers and have improved their comprehension and improve their knowledge of the world. So don't you want those collateral benefits as they're engaging with something that they want to engage with. So that's, that's one of the, that's like my, one of the things that I've been thinking about as an educator is like, why are we pretending that removing books from library is going to keep young people from asking questions? They just means it takes away a resource where a, they become better readers as they're engaging and B they have a vetted material. There's not a single book in a library that a librarian didn't put there. 
And so you can't say that for TikTok, right? You can't say that for YouTube or, or Netflix, right? But in the library, each material that's been added, there, there's been a thought and a decision process about, does this serve a real reader in the school? And if it serves someone, it belongs there. What do you hope young readers can take away from Out of Darkness? When I wrote it, I think what I most wanted was to make people build a frame that helped people to look at a painful history and to look at harm and to have a sense of deep loss over what have we done to the possibilities of many humans and our American society? And what do we need to do differently? What do we need to care about? And also to have a sense of, okay, maybe now an interracial couple isn't treated the way that they are treated in Out of Darkness, but who is? So in 2015, when I wrote this book, we didn't have marriage equality, for example. And so one of the things that I would talk to folks about is to say, hey, make sure you don't just think of this as like the ugly ways of the past. What is it now that's happening? Whose love is being marked out as forbidden or um, disruptive or problematic? And how do we create space for more people to to sur to not just survive, but to thrive in our communities? Um, I think that over the years and hearing from readers, I have new ideas about what they take away. I've done I remember doing a book club with a group of students and the whole conversation for them was around consent and basically looking at all of these different instances in the novel that illustrated the like the impossibility of consent or that, you know, a situation where uh, some because of the power dynamics, it didn't even occur to someone to consider consent versus spaces of like mutual um choice and a sense of like the safety and healing that comes with being seen as someone whose consent matters. So, you know, that's not something that I was thinking about when I was writing, but I really like to learn from readers to see what is it that they, what is it that's important to them as they read? And I think that readers, uh, readers always are going to discover things in books that we as authors didn't necessarily, um, imagine or, or set up because literature is always going to be more complex um, than we can, we can imagine. Can we expect more historical fiction from you in the future? And are there any projects that you are currently working on or planning? Yes, I'm so excited. So I have, um, I have, there are two novels lined up for me, but I'm not going to talk about those because I'm a little bit superstitious about talking about novels I haven't finished. However, I'm super excited to talk about a different project um, that will come out in 2025. Um, it's called Band Together, and it is an anthology of um, band writers who are sharing their experiences and perspectives on book banning and its impacts on communities. And so uh, that will be amazing. I'm super, super excited about it. We just announced it during band book week. And that's another example for me of the thing I want to model for my own kids who are eight and 13 and for um, writers and young people everywhere is to say, how do we take whatever it is that's happening to us and, and refuse to be stopped and beyond just refusing to be stopped to how, what can we turn it into? How do we find um, the the strategy, the way through that keeps us from being silenced. And so I think this anthology will be, it's something that librarians can collect um, even where the books have been banned. Other books have been banned. Um, we will work hard for them not to be able to have any reason that they can say that they're banning this book about book banning. I'm sure that will still happen though. <laughs> but I'm really, really excited about uh, about that. And I think it's, it's something that I've noticed that when I like some of the experiences that I've had in being banned, I I'm sure you, you, you maybe haven't seen, but feel free to link to on YouTube. The, the, like um, there was a video by a parent in a school board meeting that went viral and, you know, mischaracterized my book in these really distressing ways. And I couldn't 
stand it until I did something in response. And my partner helped me make a comical video where I'm like talking back to that school board, um, excuse me, that parent in the school board meeting. And that, that gave me relief from that. Like I'm no longer haunted by Carabelle and her outrageous remarks. I know I, took an action that allowed me to contain that harm. And I kind of do, I, I, I brought this cause I was like, well, I'll, I'll show, like I get a lot of hate mail. And so I have like, over time, I, I make, um, I, I like cut, cut it out and put it in my notebook and kind of put my little commentary on it. And it, it, it helps me. I don't know why it is until I do something with that kind of a message. It just feels like slime on me. But once I can take an action, or even if it's just in my own notebook, like uh, reframe it or talk back to it, it provides some relief. So I think band together is like a, a bigger and more public way of doing that of giving other authors who've been banned a space to say, like, I don't accept this, and I'm fighting it. And I'm standing for readers. Wow. Sounds like an amazing group of renowned authors for this book project. Exactly. What advice would you give to emerging writers who aspire to tackle difficult and controversial or historically sensitive topics in their writing? Yeah. So, I mean, I think this is one of the terrible consequences of all of this and it's intended, like this is part of the goal of the book banners is to make to, to create a reality where they don't have to go to the trouble of banning the books because one, librarians aren't buying them in the first place. Two, publishers aren't publishing them. And three, writers aren't writing them. So they're trying to, to kind of crush <laughs> creative expression around topics and issues and identities that they don't want to see. And I think that one of the one of the things that we have to do and we have to take a page from writers in other parts of the world who've dealt with much more uh pervasive censorship, we have to keep telling stories fully and truly and not letting ourselves internalize that censorship. And I th and it is extremely difficult. I'm actually for the band together collection trying to figure out a way to represent that. Like what happens when you're trying to write and you are haunted by the, the likelihood that someone is going to use whatever you write as a reason for removing everything that you've said. And I, I think that in the long run, if we want to create literature, we have to keep being brave enough to tell the stories as we know or as we feel that the story is asking to be told. And I think that one of the things I've been... Um, I, I I find really frustrating uh, 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 a kind of comment from the book banning types is things like you could have written about this history without going into such, you know, painful detail. That is true. A person can write a book about the New London school explosion that doesn't do that or about racism that doesn't do that. However, I have to write the way that I believe a story is asking to be told. And, and my commitment is to that honesty for young people and respect for their ability to, to reckon with things that some adults don't want to reckon with. And I'm not going to censor my expression to match the preferences of someone who wants to ban my book without reading it. I'm going to tell that story with the reader who needs the story in mind. And I think that that's, uh, that's my advice to folks. It, and you, and it, and at, once that pressure comes near, once you feel the constant sense of who knows where they're going to put the electric fence next, where if I go too close to that, I'm going to be harmed or I'm going to be banned. You, once that's present, it becomes a constant reality that you have to deal with, but we don't have to fence ourselves in. We can decide I, again and again, I'm taking that fence down. I don't accept those limits. I don't accept that view of what literature should be. Um, and so I think it makes writing, which is already really hard to do, it makes it harder. But ultimately, 
when we have the courage to tell the stories that we believe need to be told, um, that is its own reward. And if we look to other places, and I, I teach literature from Argentina and other other places in my day job as a literature professor, and it's it's always shocking to students to hear like, oh, this person wrote this in 1974, but no one could read it until 1986 because they wrote this, but they could not publish it. They couldn't distribute it in any way um, because they, you know, this was a time when people were being disappeared and killed for doing that. So I, I try to like keep that kind of courage present and think, okay, I'm not being, I'm not dealing with something at that level. That person still had the courage to write fully and truthfully. I have to try to find that courage myself. So I hope other writers will keep fighting uh, and resisting that censorship that wants to plant itself and itself in our, in our brains and in our hearts. Ashley, thank you for sharing your profound insights and stories with us today. The narratives in your books, Out of Darkness, The Knife and the Butterfly, What Can't Wait, opens important dialogues about our society and history. To our audience, I encourage you to explore Ashley's impactful works and join the conversations they inspire. Ashley, we can't wait to see what you're going to write next. Thanks so much for giving us so much to think about with your stories. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for having me. I loved it. But I'm going to teach a, a course on banned books in, in the summer of this next year. And I'm really excited to point people to the great interviews that you've done. So thank you for creating resources to help people learn more about these important issues. And thank you for modeling uh, taking the action that you can take. And I, I'll, I'm going to add you to my, um, the talk that I give. It means so much to me. I always tell my kids and my, um, my people, like when that affirmation comes to you, make sure you like unzip your heart and let it go in and really yeah. receive that appreciation for the work that you're doing. So, all right. Bye Christopher. It's so, such a See pleasure you. to visit with you. Thank you. My favorite interview. You too. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye.